All right, so welcome to our workshop. My name is Alyssa. I am the campus manager here at 4Geeks Academy. Uh, we're hosting a really special event tonight with an organization here in South Florida called Cafe Cultura. We have uh, four speakers associated with the organization, and they are going to talk about transitioning after the boot camp. So what to look for in job opportunities, kind of what next steps you guys should be taking, and also answer any questions you guys have related to this topic. Um, so I'll pass it off to the founder who's here, which is Zachary Johnson. Take it away. All right. Hello, hello. Um, so I'm actually here with my co-founder as well, uh, Jayla Sandoval, who is waving. Um, forgive me for like the background. I feel like I look like I'm in a Saw movie, with, like the light. So I'll try to brighten this up a little bit. Um, but thank you so much for, um, um, for having us, Alyssa. I'm really excited to be here at 4Geeks. Um, a bit more about, I guess, our org. Um, I, I'm, I'm Zach. I'm one of the co-founders of Capital Tora. Um, we support underrepresented tech professionals and underrepresented founders. Um, we do a lot of work with job placements, with um, getting more startups off the ground, um, and with just building community because we think that's the most important thing that we have. Um, so we're really happy to have tonight uh, with us Lydia De La Cruz, who um, is a friend and colleague. We've works on a couple of things together and is still working on things. And I caught wind of her amazing journey um, and some of the things that she'll probably go into deep detail with um, with regards to her transition um, when it comes to going from um, boot camp to working in tech. Um, and a bit more just about our why we're talking about this. Um, I also lead product for a company called Springboard, um, which is an ed tech organization focused on upskilling. Um, and we've also advised for another company called Careerist. So a lot of work in, in the, the bootcamp ecosystem, but obviously we're here for four geeks. So four geeks is um, the champion tonight and for anything else we talk about um, for the remainder uh, of the presentation. So I wanted to go ahead and share my screen first. Let's see if that works. Give me one second. And while I'm doing this, um, Jayla, do you want to do, maybe we'll do intros. We'll come back to them in a second, but I'm having new computer issues where I have to change a permission. Um, so Jayla, do you want to maybe introduce yourself um, and then Lydia as well before we get into the presentation? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Jayla Sandoval. I originally started my career in childcare, transitioned into media and entertainment, and was in that space for over 15 years, mostly focused on radio um and entertainment events and such which led me to when COVID happened the radio space really changed a lot and it kind of left me up in there with like what's next um and that's where i fell in love with tech tech uh, has brought me so many different opportunities meeting different types of people and the community itself has been just so amazing and welcoming that it, it really it makes me want to work even harder to keep breaking barriers and and growing the people in the tech space. So um, yeah, that was a little bit about me. Obviously, co-founder of Cafe Cultura came from a crazy idea of old internet cafes in what um, my Central American uh, background is and uh, the Caribbean background as well that you know, used to go and log in to have to pay and get 30 minutes to talk to your friends when you went to go see your family overseas or you know, to your country. So that's what the CAFE and CAFE Cultura really stands for, Internet CAFE. So I'm really excited um, that we just keep meeting such amazing people and keep growing. And you know, that leads me to Lydia. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you for that, Jayla and Zach, for that introduction. Um, as they both mentioned, I do have a tech background. I'm a software engineer, what you call a career transitioner. So I resonate with the audience. I attended a boot camp myself. I transitioned into tech back in 2020. Um, I want to say late 2019, the idea was planted in my head, as to say, and landed my first tech role as a software engineer. And alongside that, I built up my brand, which at the time, I didn't think I was building a brand. I didn't see anyone who looked like me. I didn't see anyone who was talking about transitioning into tech and going through a boot camp. And I decided to take my story to the internet and like share it with anyone else who may need it. Um, and I documented my journey from start to end, from 
being a, a career transitioner to where I'm at now, doing developer relations work. And along the path, I've been doing mentorship work, volunteer work, speaking engagements. I share plenty of resources and scholarships through that space. Um, yeah, and here I am now speaking to you all. Excited to share my resources and any tips that I have um, learned across my journey as well. And thank you so much for that, Lydia. Um, so I wanted to check, can you guys see my screen? Thumbs up, okay. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a bit of a full circle moment and we'll get into the presentation, but um, one of the things that really inspired me to go into a career at ed tech or into maximizing options and opportunities is that I was um, lucky enough to go to my dream school, Stanford. Um, I'm, I'm from Charlotte. I went to high school down in South Florida, thus all the South Florida connections. Um, but it was almost like nebulously hovering, like, where do you want to go to school? And I always wanted to go out to California. I got lucky enough to go. And one of the things about when I went from 2006 to around 2010 is that there were three big, huge social media companies, lots of the biggest um, tech companies that really would come to be, come to existence, such as Instagram, Snapchat, et cetera, all this coming from my social group. And the weird thing about being there was that the kids that were building a lot of these huge companies that, that everyone talks about today and, and that are these the ones you want to work for, oddly, we're not the most, honestly, the most academic. We were all like in fraternities, not to, not to create stereotypes. But we were we were there to like kind of balance out the party side and the and, and the, the work side. But there weren't they weren't the kids that were necessarily on the academic track. Um, they weren't even necessarily a lot of the kids that graduated. And what I started to see is that that there was a hustle culture for the, the people that were building out what would later be tech. And that same hustle culture is what I feel oftentimes in boot camps with um, companies that I work for, work with. Um, so I wanted to just make it clear that um, the, the same types of people that are going through things like four geeks and tech boot camps and have that hustle and that drive are the people who later create and belong and should be there. So it's full circle because you know the same people that we talk to now are the same people that created all these companies to begin with. So I, I, I want you guys to all know that there is no disconnect. We're all the same group. Um, so you all belong. So I want to start with that um, and then get into the presentation. So for this presentation, we wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, the first is obviously talk about career transitions in, into tech from boot camps. So we'll talk a little bit about why boot camps, why, what are some of the competitive advantages um, of being part of one. Um, we'll dive deep into to some of the misconceptions about um, you know, coming from a boot camp and working in tech. Um, we'll talk about the viability and things like that and how to maximize your opportunity. Like obviously there are all different types of boot camps or different perks and um, things that come associated with them. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, and then we'll obviously go into how to navigate careers with recruiters, with organizations, um, some of the differences between big tech and startups. And then we'll get into personal branding and actually going and doing outreach. Like how do you present yourself as an individual, as somebody who does have um, all these sets of skills, but also this amazing personality in your own story. So we'll talk about those things as well. And then um, most importantly, um, Jayla will do a spotlight on Lydia and we'll talk more about her story. And I'll be quick because I have to do all the administrative boring side things. So I'll try to make it more interesting. Um, so we already introduced ourselves. Um, Jayla and I are the founders of Capital Tora. Um, we talked a bit about us earlier, but um, we support uh, a lot of underrepresented professionals and um, tech founders in the South Florida area. Um, we're technically a national ecosystem, so we have connections all over the United States. Um, but we try to focus our um, our interests in South Florida because we see this as an innovation desert in the sense that um, while we are close to innovation and there's an idea of us being an innovation mecca here in South Florida, we still have a lot a lot of room um, to make up for. So um, we see ourselves as one of those organizations that uh, does that here in South Florida. And we talked about Lydia, so we'll get more into her story in a bit. Um, so just going over boot camps in a nutshell, um, I think that you, if you're part of this call, you probably have some background with tech boot camps or with ed tech. Um, maybe you're interested. Um, maybe you're somebody who's recently graduated or graduated many moons ago. Um, but here are just some of the, you know, the basic, um, you know, advantages of being part of a boot camp. Obviously, most boot camps are offered as time efficient, cost efficient ways to um, get the curriculum, get the knowledge that you would need, get the mentorship, uh, get the connections to actually create a career, hopefully, uh, in tech. So we, I just kind of listed some of the, the general um, advantages. 
obviously structured networking, um, career support, and job placement for CERD boot camps. Um, you know, many boot camps off, oftentimes offer continuous postgraduate support. So I see this is probably part of that process for four geeks. Um, many boot camps also include mentors, coaches, one-on-one -on -one support. Um, so with a boot camp, you basically get to in X, Y, Z number of months, get the same um, skill set that you would get from either going to college traditionally for either, let's say, software engineering, data science, um, sales doesn't necessarily have a direct track, but a lot of the um, the college career tracks that would lead to tech. And the thing about that that everyone should understand is that most tech doesn't even necessarily have a direct college track or a college degree that's parallel to the positions. So much of what um, many tech professionals have had to do is to go down this process in, in one way or another, even if they didn't go to a boot camp. So even for me, you know, having some being a, a data scientist and a, a, a product lead, um, I didn't learn those skills in college. I didn't, it's not like I went to college to study those things. I just got those skills on the fly. So that's you know, so for boot camps, this kind of gives you a, a entry in without having to go through um, a lot of those processes. And we'll talk more about the pros and cons and things like that. Uh, so one of the, the main advantages um, of being part of a tech boot camp is that you, one, get to pursue lifelong learning, but also get to be um, back into the student or mentee position. And oftentimes, as many of you probably know, like when you are considered to be somebody who's up and coming or malleable, a sponge, there are a lot of people who will step up to give you those opportunities because you're seen as somebody who's great or somebody who um, could go, go down many pathways. And I think that one thing that I recommend to any um, bootcamp graduate or really any college graduate even is to take advantage of that time frame where you're perceived to be where your, your potential outweighs what you've got on paper because everyone's like, okay, well, you just got XYZ credential. So show me what you have. I see you have great potential. And though they're almost willing to give you a clean slate and a, a basically a microscope to show me what you can do. And as you get older, as time passes, as you know, opportunities change, oftentimes as you go, go deeper down the pathway, it's less about what you could potentially do and more about what you just did on paper. So um, boot camps give you the opportunity to maximize both. It's like, hey, here's what I've done on paper, here's what I can do, and this is why you should consider me, hire me, why we should work together. Um, so we talked a little bit about the malleability. Um, I think that one of the other real big advantages of boot camps is that oftentimes there's a project portion. So it's like, hey, do a project with your mentor with this company, um, with whoever the, the bootcamp is associated with. So certain bootcamps like you know, Springboard, for instance, has a connection with Microsoft when you're doing certain things. So Microsoft is there to actually talk about certain things with um, their students and get projects that are based on real life tech stacks. So there are oftentimes lots of internships, rotational programs, capstones that are all um, built into the program. And uh, what bootcamps allow is for that built-in portfolio development. Um, that's also an example of active networking, because if you are close to your mentors or people that are part of um, your bootcamp ecosystem, you can proactively fill out your, um, your journey and say, hey, I want to talk to these people for this, this purpose, and we'll talk more about that active networking in a bit. Okay, so one of the, the big things, there, there are probably three big um, misconceptions that I've I've oftentimes seen, and what, this is where we're going to get to the, the more honest part of the, the conversation um, that we see with boot camps. Uh, one of the first ones is something along the lines of you need to go to college to get your the degree that's most associated with XYZ track, um, or that boot camps are an inadequate um, alternative to traditional college pathways. Um, and again, just to kind of echo my earlier sentiment, this is couldn't be further from the truth. Um, oftentimes, many SaaS companies were founded and created by people who did not go down a traditional path. In fact, most tech companies, if you were to just look at the founders that were, and where they come from and what they've done educationally, they don't necessarily on paper seem like they would be the person that would even be hired compared to somebody who went to college. But their projects, the things, the, the connections they made, the, the things that they saw in the market is what made them inspired to go and create the companies and to hire the first hires of, their, of whatever company they started. So um, even now with uh, the more mature ecosystem, um, tech boot camps are a more than viable pathway to career success. Um, the other statement that's oftentimes stated is that tech boot camps guarantee uh, a job in tech, and I would say the, the reality is that that's not the case. Even though there are quite a few boot camps that have great stats in terms of job placements and things like that, 
Um, there are lots of factors that go into why somebody might not be hired from seasonality to the market to um, the reputation of the boot camp to you know the person's re you know resume and LinkedIn and their ability to tell their story. Um, so none of these things come with guarantees, but they do get, get a foot in the door. Um, the third thing that I wanted to focus on is that tech this, this idea that tech tech camp graduates um, are only placed in a certain types of roles. Um, it's important to understand that some companies do have a, a certain perception of bootcamp graduates and where they think they track. Like they're like, well, are they below, let's say for software engineer, for instance, are they below, you know, a junior engineer? Are they below um, X, Y, Z? And it, it kind of depends on the company and the, the, the people at the company who've already been successful. Oftentimes, like a, a lot of the, the senior leads of, let's say, the engineering departments, the data departments, a lot of the sales departments are bootcamp graduates. So a lot of times those sigmas are not there, but it's a bit of a mixed bag. So you, you'll have to go through the process and get a sense of what what the company politics are, to be frank, and um, how things are, are, are perceived. Obviously, that shouldn't stop you from applying and you know jumping into, into that market. But know that every company is different with regards to what we call company culture. So that's why it'll be really important to talk to people who work there and get an inside track. Um, so another question is, are boot camps still viable? Um, boot camps and upskilling are the future. Um, if you probably, I'm sure for a lot of the younger people um, on the call, you're probably noticing that a lot of people are saying, oh, I'm just gonna skip college and go straight to doing a tech boot camp, or I'll do a boot camp while I'm in college, or I'll do one of these programs um, you know, while even in high school, you know, there are all these these different layers of um, boot camps and viability that have like popped up. The ed tech industry is definitely here to stay. Um, so, so mastering that career transition, understanding that is going to be very valuable for anybody who wants to be in the industry. Um, lastly, how do you maximize your boot camp experience? Um, we talked a little bit about mentors and coaches. Um, that's definitely something that we want to we want to highlight. You definitely want to talk to the mentors and coaches that are part of your boot camp to see if they can position you, if they can give you like really honest feedback on what the market looks like, what your particular vertical looks like at the moment, um, even extending their network. Um, we talked a little bit about looking into the career development resources at said boot camp. So you know, Four Geeks, for instance, has um, you know lots of admin and social project support. We can actually reach out to people and say, hey, you know, what are some of the Things that my other cohort, my cohort is doing. What are what are things that graduates have done? Um, what are some of the the connections that you, maybe you have for career development and and potential jobs? So um, there are lots of ways that you can tap into your boot camp itself to de definitely like maximize and talk to everyone there. Don't let anything passively go by. I think that that's oftentimes a, a mistake of having such a, a grand experience of having an entire group dedicated just to your success. So while you do have people that care about just your career success, you want to make sure that you maximize it. Um, and that can also be through the mentors. Again, they have their own networks and, and people that are there to maximize success as well. Um, and just one other heads up, we're going to go into Q&A at the end. So keep your questions um, after Lydia in the spotlight. So um, feel free to write down questions as they come up. Um, so now we're get, getting into the, the part of the presentation regarding um, the actual job search and figuring out how to position yourself. Um, so once you graduate, um, most of you will already have some type of portfolio from your project, um, for lack of a better term. I'm trying to use terms that translate to all boot camps, but whatever your project or capstone was, you'll have that. You'll have your cohort relationships, um, and you'll obviously have the credential that you, you've graduated or you know gone through XYZ boot camp. So you want to make sure that that's all um, really clearly indicated on all of your social media platforms, particularly ones that are that are more focused on jobs and opportunities. So LinkedIn, um, well-found jobs is a really important resource, especially in the startup community. Um, GitHub for those that it applies to, um, and then your website, resume, and any other platforms. Um, you want to make sure that that's all up to date. Um, oftentimes. I've seen graduates actually make an announcement with some type of associated image. It could be of them. It could be of the some boot camps actually give you like a, a PDF or a placard or something like that. Um, however, you want to you want to you know make, jazz it up essentially. You want to make it known what your new position is and step into the role. Um, this is where imposter syndrome oftentimes come in, comes in because when you are going from not being someone who you know worked in tech to all of a sudden it's like, hey, I know you as you have a completely different job and different tracks. And now all of a sudden you're a software engineer, all of a sudden you're a data scientist, all of a sudden you're 
these things that you know seem nebulous or important to me. Um, one of the biggest things and the reasons that you do do that post is that you want to step into speaking about yourself confidently in your new career track. Um, most of this is about positioning and how you present yourself, what, what you tell about your story. Um, so it's going to be important that on top of the data, like, hey, I did this, I work with this company, I have this background, I'm also comfortable in my own skin to tell my story as, you know, Zach, the data scientist, or Zach, the product manager, whatever it may be, um, it's very important. So make sure that you're you're ready to tell your story because that's going to be one of the main things that people care about in a very surprising way. Um, oftentimes people think that it's about just what you you know do you have the degree or the credential, but it's like no, what story are you going to tell? Um, the the other thing that's really important is to understand the differences between different social media types. So there are. Um, there are social media platforms like LinkedIn or WellFound that are more focused on just like, what have you done? Show me examples of your, your work, um, talk about your work, uh, talk about what you care about, um, even or versus things that are more social like Twitter or Instagram. And one of the most important things for positioning yourself for career is to know that we all have our own, our own resumes. We all have data. We all have things that are clear, like I worked here, I did this. But what about how you think? What about what you care about? What about how you got there? Um, a lot of times we make the mistake of not showcasing those those middle parts. And that's oftentimes what's most important to employers, but also to people who work at those companies or are creating those companies who are just looking at, at people's interests online. And then they'll think about you when they're doing active recruitment or when they're actually pushing for a job. Um, roughly 87% of jobs, especially in tech that go out and are filled, don't actually go through typical application processes. They go through referrals or they go through friends of friends. So it's very important that as a as you brand yourself, that not only do you post that, yes, I am this person, I have this credential, I'm working in this capacity, but you also talk about maybe some of the things that you care about. So I'm, I'm working on this project. I was just thinking about how this works or I was really inspired today to do this. And I know that sometimes sounds a bit cheesy, but that does help individuals and organizations understand you as a person. And that then leads to them being more likely to bring you in, to recommend you, to have you be on that inside track. Because unfortunately, um, to allude back to what I said before, a lot of a lot of tech companies in particular are very much, um, for lack of a better term, almost like fraternities and even like boys clubs. And I, and I mean that in that way. Um, so we're trying to break those barriers and break things like that. Um, but that means that it's important to to know how to navigate and to be seen. So be seen for who you are and what you do, and it makes it a lot easier to navigate and find other people who are allies in the same fight, let's say, or trying to get more people that come from your, your background or look like you or have, you know, have your same skill sets into the door. So it's very important to make sure that's clear. Um, the other big thing will be finding your tribe. So um, if you don't have a built-in Network. Most of you do. If you if you're graduating from boot camp, then it means that you have at least a cohort and a greater community to tap into. So all the um, the Slack channels or the Discords or wherever you, you guys communicate, um, there's an easy way to go and find people in your area who have your same interests, who can maybe help you out or go into the same process at the same time. And it's very important for two reasons. One for um, upper mobility, so somebody who maybe a senior and or a director or something that can come in and help you but also for the lateral growth where we're all coming up together. So we all went through this process together. So in 10 years, it might be a lot easier for not only for us to move laterally between companies because we all have our own tracks, but also for us to pull up other people that are part of our communities. So finding your tribe is, is very, very important. Um, most big tech companies have different types of groups. Uh, there's something called an ERG, um, which is oftentimes an internal um, demographic based groups so that can be based on um, you know, like women in tech, um, it could be demographic background and race, age, background, sexual orientation. Um, those are actually super actionable um, tribes to tap into at big tech companies um, because oftentimes they're more likely to target certain types of people for recruitment. Um, there are also regional organizations like Cafe Cultura. It's like, hey, we're focused on South Florida, we're focused on New York, we're focused on whatever it may be. So feel free to find some type of alignment um and individuals within that organization that maybe could actually bring you in because they're usually set up just to target certain segments so you want to figure out what segment you maybe fall into um within reason obviously you're much bigger than just that but look at the opportunities that i could create for people who are looking for your particular segment 
Um, the other big thing that you want to also focus on is the difference between mentors and sponsors. So uh, one of the best career advice things that I ever heard was that there's a, there's a difference, right? You, your mentor is somebody who's going to talk to you and develop a relationship with you individually and help you grow in that way. But your sponsor is somebody who's going to activate their network or their position to actually put you in position. Um, sometimes these are the same people. Sometimes they're different people. So it's very important to try to find some type of mentor and sponsor relationship as you graduate or you know, if you are post-grad. And that can be through uh, social engagements. That can be through online. Um, that could be through just like message boards. Whatever it is, you want to find people who are doing what you want to do and can help position you in some way. And this is not to mean to, to be a transactional thing. It's more about genuine interest and genuine passion for coming and working in the same type of way. Uh, so one of the best things that I've had for me is finding other founders or other people who wanted to do the same types of things. And we built the same products. Those people became my co-founders. But um, when it comes to finding jobs, that same type of um, that same type of thought process applies. You also don't want to be afraid to uh, link up with classmates or cohort friends that inspired you. Because again, this could be a, a lateral move as you guys move up, you move up together. And sometimes the people that are just right next to you working on the same things are the people that will become your hiring manager or the person who creates the company or is is the person that you need to go and interview with. So you want to make sure that regardless of what level people are at, there's there's a lot of value and just shared interests and a common passion for what you do. Um, OK, so another big thing here. So we have uh, startups versus big tech. Um, and I'll try to get through because I know we're, we're tight on time. Um, one thing that everyone wants to consider is that there are different types of tech companies and they oftentimes begin as startups and then mature into big tech companies. And even at that stage, oftentimes they're still considered to be startups. So don't limit yourself just to companies that you've heard of. Um, oftentimes they're major, super well-funded, super interesting companies that are out there that maybe are not on your radar, but are could potentially be great opportunities for you. So think about what type of company you want to work for. Um, and really do a lot of research on what companies are in position um, to, to make, make impact. And that oftentimes depends on their level of, of funding. You know, so there's like something called pre-seed funds, and that goes all the way up until Series A, Series B, and all the letters after, usually up until Series D. Um, so if you can find a company that's at least at seed stage or preferably Series A and above, um, they oftentimes do have some resources to, to take some chances and to hire people. And you want to balance those opportunities if you're interested with the big tech companies and with other you know, traditional Forge 500 companies as well. Um, there are some risks, obviously, with any type of job that you pull in. But I think that those companies are oftentimes overlooked. And the advantage for um, tech bootcamp graduates is that they're oftentimes more open to just take you in based on your, your grit, your experience, and they can still pay oftentimes the same level or at higher levels even than big tech because they're like, okay, you're a person, we'll give you tons of responsibility. It's not gonna come and, and be easy, but it does give you a great title and a lot of ways to build out your career. So look at all the universe of options and then see which ones um, makes the most sense for you. Um, so yeah, here, but here, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that there are certain websites that are really great for startups. Um, one of them that I, I really love to use is Well Found Jobs, um, AngelList, uh, crunch base. This will give you a good sense of the lay of the land of startups. And oftentimes these are companies that you might want to consider. Um, the other thing is that most startups are going to be in places that are developing cities. So for instance, I, I mentioned Miami, a lot of our ecosystem is startup rich, but big tech poor. So we don't have, we, we oftentimes have the mirage of all these big tech companies coming here. And then like they, some of them say, some of them leave, but we will always have startups here. And the thing about that is that they oftentimes can't find candidates to hire because everyone is trying to go and work in the other city or work for the big company. So there's a big opportunity for a lot of bootcamp graduates in particular to consider startups on top of everything else um, that you might maybe are considering right now. Um, another thing that you maybe want to consider here is hackathons and projects. Uh, so if you don't have a built-in network and you still haven't found your tribe, um, they're oftentimes regional or college hackathons, special interest hackathons, citywide hackathons. Um, these are opportunities to go and test your skills, um, to build products that could turn into startups, into companies, into you know, co-founders, um, into hiring managers that want to bring you in. So hackathons are a good place to go and showcase your skills. 
if you want to be more skill focused versus being social focused because obviously some of us aren't necessarily going to be as open to um, just going to happy hour and, and casually sitting with a, a drink in our hand in the corner and talking to people you maybe you want to go to a hackathon and actually build something and say this is what i do so definitely another option um, so this kind of gets to our, our Jayla and uh, Lydia part of the presentation, which I'm excited about. Um, one of the, the most important things that you want to do here is look at your personal branding. So on top of the data, on top of the things that you've done and the, you know what you are on paper, there's also like what story are you telling? What are you bringing to the table that's unique to you based on your background? So one of the easiest ways to do that is to focus on potentially building out your own personal brand. And that can be you as an individual, or that can be you as a business entity or a social. Like, it, there are all these different ways to do it. But I've seen a lot of success with people who look at personal branding. I won't see the thunder there because I think we'll talk about that later. But um, that's definitely something that you want to consider. And my my last slide here is that make sure that as you as you do reach out to people and you start to build out your track, your brand, make sure that it's targeted. You know, really be intentional. I think the biggest thing that I wish I would have done earlier is being intentional with networking instead of just going out for the sake of going out. Um, there are lots of times where there's special interests or things that are aligned to this community cares about this subject or that subject, or you know, we have a career line that we also want to hang out and do things. Um, so look at the ways that you can have a targeted outreach to how you socialize and how you present yourself, and then overlay that with the personal brand side. Um, so I know I, I talked a ton, but I'm going to hand it over finally. Um, to uh, to Jayla and to Lydia for a spotlight on her um, her transition into tech and how she built out her personal brand. Thank you, Zach, for that awesome presentation. Uh, I'm very excited to have this conversation with Lydia right as uh, the spotlight. Um, so I'm gonna let um, Lydia kind of you know start a little bit telling her story and kind of where you started and where your transition was. Yeah, so like I mentioned, back in 2019 is where this idea was like kind of planted in my head. Um, so just some background information. I have six years of working in education here in New York City and working as an operations manager, director and leader, managing teams, creating processes and systems and working with different students. Um, and I couldn't really find myself in that space in the education sector, but it still resonates with me till this day. And someone saw the potential in me and recognized my skills and ability and my curiosity. Um, and from there on, this person who was also a fellow Latina in tech pursuing her own career was kind of recruiting me. It's like, we need representation. Come to this side of the world. Um, figure out how you can fit in tech. And at the time she was studying cybersecurity and that's not something that really called my attention, but I did see software engineering. And I thought to myself, this is pretty cool. Like I can bring, to, you know, build technology and et cetera. And that is when I started doing my, my, my actual homework and investing and figuring out what route do I want to take? Do I want to go back to school and get an actual college degree or do I want to do a boot camp? Um, and that's when I started doing my research along that came resources. And I'm like, why is no one sharing this or talking about this, right? I went online to look for blogs, um, Instagram accounts, Facebook accounts, anything that actually talked about what it was to be a career transitioner. And I only came across Medium articles at the time. And that's when I kind of decided to build my, my personal brand and just talk about my journey and, and what it was to be a software engineer. Um, and fast forward, it's been about four, four to five years from now. <laughs> so my one of my questions is, you know, you like you said, you were transitioning from a tech back, I mean, from an education background into tech. What steps I think were crucial for you into like really making that leap and saying, okay, I think we can do this? Because I know as a Latina, um, sometimes we have we get a lot of imposter syndrome and like, can I really do this? Like, what, like, why, like, why am I transitioning mm -hmm. into this position? Yeah. I think the important factors for me at the time when I was pivoting was my finances, right? Because the back of my head, right? I'm like, okay, I wrote down in a notebook. I'm like, 2020 is my new year. I'm going to, so 2019, I did the preparing for it. I prepared enough savings. Um, I eliminated my debt in, at the time. And I said, I'm going to quit my job 
in 2020, 2020 is my year, I'm going to quit and I'm going to invest in this career transition. But I also was strategic. I was like, there has to be resources and scholarships and something that can prepare me and accelerate my journey without me having to financially invest, right? And I started doing Code Academy. I started talking to different mentors in the community who already made this transition and get that reassurance and also that validation that there is something that I can do, right? Because I'm like, you know, I, this is a whole different field. I have zero experience in, there's not enough representation. Um, I already have professional experience in education. Like how can I translate this? But I think um, going back to the community and the tribe aspect, seeking out people in the network who, who did this, who look like me, and just getting reassurance that this is something that I can also do myself. You mentioned about investing in yourself. Um, I know mm -hmm. sometimes we think it's harder than what it is, but then at the same time, most people are out you know, doing brunches for hundreds of dollars or going on vacations for hundreds of dollars. Where mm -hmm. did you click on that like, foundation or what was it that really was like, okay, I need to invest in myself in order to move forward? Yeah, I think it, the fact that I was going to, it's like learning a whole language in a way. I was diving into a sector that I had no familiarity with, no experience, no education. And I really wanted to get an understanding what it was to be a software engineer. So I told myself, if I'm going to financially invest into this commitment and go into a coding boot camp and pretty much quit my job, <laughs> I have to be very serious and invest in this. Um, and I began doing free resources. Um, everyone knows Code Academy. I did two hours after work in the library to doing Code Academy. On Saturdays mornings, I would do Code Academy. Um, and I'd meet up with different accountability groups that I met along the way and dived into Code Academy. I just invested multiple hours because I also wanted to go into the coding bootcamp having some sort of foundation and understanding of what it is that I was going to get into. How important were those accountability buddies or the, your group, your, your little accountability tribe? How important was that to your success in transitioning? Oh man, so important. And I think I, I like that um, Zach highlighted that in the previous slides about finding your community and your tribe because I have friends, actual friends that I can actually count on and say these are my friends that I met as I was like exploring different coding boot camps and going to info sessions and doing things like that that I met online. So that led to in person friendships. Then I'll have another circle of friends that I actually did the coding boot camp with that we were four months in a pandemic, eight to 10 hours in front of a screen when the whole world was kind of shut down. And I have friends that I've built from that community and tribe that I can say are my friends to this day going on four years, right? Um, it was, it's vital, it's necessary. You know, we're social beings and just having someone else that you can vent to and understand your struggles and also share your wins with, it's very validating. It's like, we're kind of going towards the same goal. We're right there, we're not competing. <laughs> And just having that there is, um, it's an essence. I feel like it's vital. It's like necessary. So I know that one of the biggest issues that a lot of the first generation um, is having, no matter where you come from, the first born in the family, you know, especially for our families, um, it's tech is not always like, hey, I'm working a nine to five. Here's my paycheck. You know, um, how, how did that affect you or how did you work, navigate through that? in with you and maybe your family because i know it's difficult even for my parents they're like oh okay you do tech but like are you in it and i'm like um no you know and explaining <laughs> it to them <laughs> explaining it to them you know has become a thing you know or explaining mm -hmm. it to your friends or the people that you know your family how was that for you yeah um so i'm actually the oldest daughter at that and um my both my parents are immigrants they immigrated here not knowing the language and i'm an english language learner meaning that my first language is spanish and i learned english you know at school um so for me it was it's pretty interesting right because i do these speaking engagements you know i go to conferences 
Um, I'm featured in articles and my parents are like, wait, what do you do again? I don't understand. <laughs> um, but I think showing them, right? I think um, showing them what I do, I'm like, okay, I build applications and products like the website and actually showing them the code and kind of making some like very small minor changes on an application or website and then seeing them see the changes they're like oh that's what you do and i'm like yeah so i think um there is a knowledge gap when it comes explaining that especially to non-technical folks but again like i mentioned earlier i do have an education background and that skill lives with me and it's a transferable skill and because i have that now that i have my technical background i'm able to communicate to a non-technical audience because i kind of I, I know what it is to work with students i know there's learning styles i know what it is to be a teacher and etc um so in that aspect I, I explain what it is that i do um also just going from like working in education sector to kind of working in a tech company is like really different like there's all these like meetings that are called stand-ups all these like workflows things that i wasn't really aware of um erg groups that zach mentioned earlier which are employee resource groups so it was really like an interesting transition but i was really excited for it and then that leads me you know obviously to your self-branding because i know a lot of people in tech tend to focus and stay in the tech side and kind of forget about the self-branding side um mm -hmm. you know and i know that not everybody can or cannot kind of fit into that so how did you manage to translate all of that into a personal brand yeah like i mentioned earlier i um i was looking for someone who also who did this as well who documented it in some way or form and i didn't come across someone like that um and someone who identified with my identity my multiple identities so I decided to be that person. I was like, somewhere out there, someone's going to probably do the same thing. <laughs> so let me go ahead and unshare it. Um, another thing too, I realized is that as I was making this transition, I was coming across so many resources. I mean, and I couldn't believe it. And I wanted to share it with the community, right? So I would share it in group messages and in text messages. And I'm like, I actually want to share it to a larger audience. And that's where my brand came about, um, which is for the Rosa Coding. And that's when I just started storytelling. I just started to share my story in the little corner of the internet um, during the pandemic when we were all connected socially and on the internet. And as a social being, I'm very social and I kind of didn't have that social aspect during the pandemic. So I use social media to be like my social network and me going to virtual events was like me socializing in a way because that's the only thing we could do. Um, <laughs> And yeah, that's where I kind of built my brand. And along the lines, people were like, yeah, you're like, a, a, a this is your personal brand. Like you're a developer advocate, you're storytelling and all these terms started to come about. And I'm like, I just shared my story. <laughs> um, but I must say sharing my story, I, I don't regret it. And I, I love the doors of opportunity it has opened for me being in spaces like these being in um, spaces with where I'm connecting with recruiters, being in spaces where I'm mentoring folks, and being in spaces where because of my story and because of the work that I do has led them to success, right? So there's multiple points of um, rewards for me in creating my brand that I had no idea um, it would have gotten to this point, right? Absolutely. And tell us a little bit more about your brand and mm -hmm. where you started and where you are right now and what's coming. Yeah. Um, so the beautiful part about it is that I have people who follow my Instagram, LinkedIn, um, TikTok and Twitter. That's where most of my branding is at the moment. And they remember me from the beginning. They were like, we can't believe you walked us through an entire boot camp journey. You walked us through what it is to be job search. You have walked us through um, what it is to be a software engineer, right? And I feel like my personal brand is a chapter of my life. It's an extension of where is Lydia and in her current career transition, right? Um, and it's, an, it's a page. Uh, I'm identified as an Afro-Latina in tech. 
born and raised from the Bronx. I probably state that mm-hmm. here in New York City. <laughs> and um, yeah, just demystifying um, the different stigmas, uh, imposter syndrome, and using my story to motivate and inspire others. I share tons of resources because till this day, I come across so many different resources. So I kind of share that to my community. Um, I do a lot of mentorship work as well, volunteer work, um, anywhere from along the lines from like resume review, LinkedIn review, or what it is to create a personal brand, right? A lot of folks see my success, see where my platform has grown and want to be able to do the same thing and kind of don't know where to start. And I'm kind of that kind of um, contact person where I kind of guide them. I, I share them tips and different resources on how I myself build my brand and how I kind of navigate that <laughs> while having a job and also having a personal life as well. Because be, building a brand is also a job in itself as well. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And I know for us at Cafe Cultura, that's one of you know my, my services that I specifically feel like really attached to is building that brand being able to speak up for yourself rather than have others speaking for you especially as startups and founders and you know taking it to that next step pe- people resonate with you with your story with mm-hmm. what you go through so i think it's really important and obviously you're such a great example of that the res- you know how people resonated with you and everything i know um obviously you said you went to boot camp what mm-hmm. are, what is some advice post boot camp that you have mm-hmm. for people that are going through it or have just recently finished one of their boot camps? Um, I think for me is building, it's so important to foster and nurture the relationships that you built during your boot camp and be intentional about building those uh, friendships. Because uh, I can't stress enough the um, connections that I have made during my boot camp journey, like our, my cohort is, a, we're a close cohort, <laughs> right? And if you think of it, everyone there, about 30 of us, went out into the world and got tech jobs. That to me is like, I have 30 connections in 30 different companies. And these are my friends and I'm gonna nur- like stay in contact with them and nurture them. And I know that if I do need a job at X company where they're at, they'll happily refer me because I built that relationship maintained it, sustained it, and nurtured it. Um, so that's one of, my, one of my key things is community, um, finding your tribe, and being very intentional about it. I think the second thing that I, have to, I do have to say is that storytelling and like sharing on the internet, right? So for me, I started sharing even before I got into a boot camp, right? I went on LinkedIn, wrote a post of, these are the coding boot camps I'm starting, right? And I started putting it out there, putting content out there. I started an Instagram account, right? Um, Whenever I complete a project or learn something new, I take it to the internet and I share with the internet what I learned, right? And as a recruiter or anyone in my network that would even like it, then whoever they're following them is, I'm getting that outreach too. Absolutely. And that branches out and that lands me in some recruiter's newsfeed without me actually doing like reaching out to them. It's just by sharing with the internet what I've learned. Um, yeah, learn in public. <laughs> um, so yeah, I take snippets of my projects. I talk about my um, my wins. I'd also talk about my losses as well. Whenever I did any like leak code problems and I solved it and I learned something from it, I took it to the internet. Hey, I solved this LinkedIn problem. I came across this, I learned this pattern and et cetera. And that really landed me in news feeds of recruiters that are messaging me because now, because I have shared what I'm going through, they can not only see that I'm, I'm learning, I'm curious, um, I'm sharing with the internet my wins and, and losses. So I'm very open to sharing that. And they can, with a simple click, they can probably go into my GitHub without having to sit and search through it as well. Um, so definitely I wanna say presence in the social space is key importance as well. Tell us, um, I know we're going to go into Mm Q&A because we're running a little tight on time, Um, but just tell us, I guess, what your next steps are. What can we expect from you and your Mm -hmm. company and your branding? Yeah, Um, I have personal goals. Um, My personal goal that I want to achieve with my personal brand is to speak 
at a conference, at a well-recognized conference in person to a large audience. That's kind of my thing. I have a couple of conferences that I have in mind that I um, admire. I love the spaces that they have uh, created. And I'd love to be part of um, one of their speaking panels and be included and to see next to trailblazers in the tech community. Um, and as for me, as, a, as in my career, I'm, I'm making, I mean, like I said, I'm a software engineer, but I'm kind of pivoting into developer relations side. I really enjoy that aspect of it, using my technical skills. So not sure, a lot of, a lot of <laughs> what ifs and maybes and not sure moments. Well, that's a great thing about tech that there's a lot of different opportunities and one one door mm -hmm. leads to another door and then you end up somewhere you never thought you'd be. I, that's how Absolutely. I feel all the time and I love it because it's just a different experience. You're always on your toes. You're always meeting new mm -hmm. people. So it's definitely great. Lydia, thank you so much for being here oh, with thank us. You. And thank you to Fair Geeks for allowing us to do the spotlight and how can they get in contact with you right before we open the q a if anybody wants to get in contact yeah. with you what's the best way definitely on linkedin as you all see my name here you can just kind of pop my name onto linkedin um linkedin i also have my brand name for little coding which you can come kind of add me on all social media platforms i'm kind of on all of them <laughs> and i also have my email address linked to my linkedin account as well so anyone is more than happy to reach out to me via email as well thank you so much lydia i thank can't wait you. to see everything you have coming and zach do you want to take it away for the q a <laughs> yeah so clearly they're like much better at the presentation side than i am so sorry i'm back hi uh but we're, we're here for uh the the, the q a side um wanted to open things up and I'm not even on the right screen. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, so any any questions, I suppose, if you guys have any, um, feel free to, to drop in the chat or even if people want to come off of mute. Okay, I see uh, you raised hands, so how should we do that? Um, do you, uh, is it Yara? Yara. Yes. So can you tell us a bit more about hackathons? Because like, I've seen a lot of hackathons, but a lot of the times they they show uh, tech stacks that I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, yeah. As juniors, I mean, are, can we still apply to those? Do we have a chance to those? Yeah, so it, it kind of depends on, um, on the hackathon. Some of them are highly, highly technical, and some of them have like a wide range of expertise levels and some of them are for are for early you know early hackers or early early programmers people who are early to tech um what, what you probably want to do is contact the admin or contact the person who's doing the either the branding or the the outreach if they don't know they probably have connections to somebody who knows um i think that if you do join a hackathon keep that in mind that it's more for like the social component but you want to make sure that you're there and that you're maximizing your time right like i've seen hackathons where they have junior level people with people who are literally like 15 years of experience on the same team and that can be great but if it's not structured the right way it can be problematic um so the short answer is that yes definitely still apply and reach out especially if there are things that are for your particular um group or if it's not going to be something that's going to cost you money uh they're great experiences we we've done a lot with uh orgs like miami hack week um and you know even like the uh, shell hacks things like that so down in florida so there are a lot of really great opportunities um, that that I would I would just say definitely apply and just ask around to see what the levels are that you're expected to be at and then they usually will will train you on at least rudimentary some of the the stack if you are doing something that has multiple levels of experience so you're expected to learn from your from your team and kind of learn on the fly that's part of the fun of it and part of the challenge of it. Okay, so uh, there was this other thing about hackathons. Uh, I don't know if they were called phases or or milestones. I forgot what they are called, but each of them has like a like a cash price to it. Is it because you integrated a specific technology to the app or is it something else? Usually for hackathons, they're like sponsored prizes based on whatever corporate or organizational sponsor is, is associated. Um, they try to integrate that into either the product that you produce or the stack that you use. 
Um, oftentimes the stack is a bit arbitrary because it's just like we have credits in this organization, so this doesn't cost us anything, honestly. Um, so uh, the, the phases are, are, are meant, meant to kind of weed out certain people who maybe aren't, like, obviously everyone's great, but like, you know, like to weed out like the, the top people or the top groups, and then they want to make sure they have a great presentation at the end for the, the final product. So, um, and I would keep in mind that for hackathons, it's more about the experience and the networking. And it's less about like, you know, the, the cash prizes, like those are great, obviously, um, but it's more about the networking and the people that you're working with that that has significant value. And there's a big difference between value and, and money. And oftentimes for tech, um, that that tends to be very obvious. Like as you get into it, the most value that you'll get is just the network and the money side is, is just like, you know, like cherry the cherry on top. Okay. And uh, the final question, uh do you pick your teams or are you randomly assigned? It depends on the hackathon. Um, and I'm open to definitely having a, a deeper conversation about that because we, we've been part of quite a few. Um, but yeah, it kind of depends on the hackathon. Sometimes it's random. Usually it's it's random or it's like meant to be shaken up or they try to break, you know, balance out the team. So if you have somebody who's super senior, you balance out people who are more junior and, and you know, they, they, they try to make it a competitive um, type of thing with parity. So it's not going to be like one team just has people that are super senior and other people who just aren't going to be able to compete. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Zach, yeah. we have a question from Maria saying, what are the best communities to join after graduating from a boot camp? You, somebody else want to take that? Where I can, it's up to you. Lydia? Take. I can go ahead and take it. Yeah. I think um, for me, um, I just found communities where I um, identify. So I, like I mentioned earlier, I identify as an Afro-Latina. So I joined Latinos in Tech, um, New York City chapter. They're kind of worldwide. Um, I also joined um, Blacks in Technology as well, um, Equeria as well, um, Cultura, yeah. So it really depends on your identity and what you identify as and finding those communities. Um, I would definitely recommend Meetup and Eventbrite for your specific community if you're not based in New York City or just anywhere in general. Go in there and just type in a search bar like tech or just technology or just software engineering. And I'm pretty sure you're going to find either like local like grassroots community groups or like larger organizations like the ones I mentioned. Thank you, Lydia, for that. Uh, we have Hector says, being how comp the job market is, what would you recommend to try to find an entry job or look for an internship? Um, <clears throat> so I would say that there's a lot of opportunity with startups. And, um, and I know like I'm a bit biased because I've, I've been a, a serial startup founder and oftentimes, you know, there, there are pros and cons, but I, I would say that in this market, um, a lot of times you do have startups that are funded who can um, actually give you paid work and a really awesome, interesting project. Um, and depending on what their level of funding is, they might only be around for a year or two. And, you know, it kind of changes as they get more and more money. But that's where you get a lot of experience in a short amount of time. And that oftentimes, at least as a, as a stepping stone to your next job. So I'd recommend looking at startups at places like well-found jobs. Um, there are lots of startup competitions and showcases. Um, there are pitch competitions. There are big accelerators like you know YC, Startex, Techstars, um, A16. They're places that basically incubate startups. So if, if I were a bootcamp graduate, I would actually go and go to those demo days even if they're virtual and just get a sense of what startups are because you can get a sense of how much they've raised not that the, that only matters but you know how much they raise and what they're doing and directly hit up those founders and oftentimes at the startup phase people will respond to you if you're trying to go and contact google on linkedin unless you know somebody at google it's going to be hard to get somebody who can actually be a mover and shaker at google but if you actually are going and saying hey I saw you had a great um, presentation at Techstars. I'm local to you. I'm just really curious about any potential opportunities you might have. I'm open to internships. You'd be surprised at how many founders with amazing experiences and backgrounds will actually give you an opportunity just because they, they like that you reach out to them. So I think that's one way to look at it. Um, obviously, another big opportunity is using platforms like LinkedIn, like well-found to find people at companies and just 
talk about your interests and, and try to have a general exploratory conversation. Hey, can I can I talk to you? Can I get learn more about the company? I don't know if you have a position for me right now, but I just want to tell you a bit more about me and, and, and what I'm looking for. And you, again, you'd be surprised at how many people want to to take take that in and they'll actually ping you as the, the roles come up. Like people will just keep you in mind. And I think that that's something that we want to keep we want to have is that you're always honestly working on some on some level in the recruitment cycle. And that's something I wish I would have known way earlier in life. Like I should always be applying to my next job just by how I move and what my actions are. Um, it's not always just when you have a job. So I think you can start that early and then keep that going as you progress through your career. Um, in terms of other entry level tools, uh, I think those are probably the, the two best, you know, diversify the tools that you're using to look for jobs. Um, and then look for rotational programs at big tech companies. Oftentimes, like their companies like Box, Cisco, et cetera, that have rotational programs just for early graduates. Um, so look at things like that. And they're also ERG sponsored um, programs for early graduates, so people who only have, let's say, zero to three years of experience that are just meant to foster new community. So reach out to the recruiters and to the, the the people from those companies to see what those opportunities are. So say, hey, I'm a student or hey, I just graduated. I want to know about your entry level opportunities and directly ping those people on LinkedIn, WellFound or social media. All right. We have another question from Alejandro. He says, any advice on how to do leak code or hacker rank exercises faster during technical interviews? Well, yeah, that, that might be one for you because I'm a, I'm a product manager and data scientist. But. Yeah, that's funny. That question was asked and then I'm like looking at a sticky note I have here. Like, I don't know if anybody can see this. Leak code tips is called. <laughs> so this is like a leak code tip that I got um, from uh, just the communities I've been part of and accountability groups. Um, so leak code is... Uh, Solving leak code and algorithm problems is a muscle, a muscle that you have to continuously work on <laughs> until you start recognizing patterns, until you start getting familiarized with them. So for me, I broke it down. So easy problems, I spend 15 minutes on it. And when I say 15 minutes on it, it's like 15 minutes of me actually reading the problem, digesting the problem, figuring out what it is that I need to do, getting a clear understanding, walking through the problem, giving the uh, results, and also doing research online. I set a timer, right? So that's for easy problems. For medium problems, I spend anywhere to try to solve it, including discovery, meaning going online and figuring out what data structure, what pattern am I looking at, what is it asking for? Anywhere from 30, 30 minutes to an hour, maximum. And hard problems is usually my personal choice if I'm really um, having a hard time. I don't spend more than an hour on a problem. If I spend more than an hour on the problem, then I'm just wasting my time because there's not much that I can do more than an hour. So I think you have to time yourself, set a timer from the moment you start, and Leco does have this built-in feature where you can set a timer for yourself and start timing yourself, right? And start identifying patterns. I say, join accountability groups. I can't stress that enough. You really can't do this uh, on your own. Like you really need community because there's so many different people that have so many different views and there's so many ways to solve an algorithm at that, um, that you can get an understanding on how someone else thinks, and it can also spark an idea within you, and you can get a better understanding of a legal problem. Um, and it's just really good accountability group. Like, I think talking out loud and discussing and like working on a problem with someone else really allows you to fully understand what's happening. Um, and again, the accountability aspect, like you're doing something together, so it's also a learning moment where either you can be the teacher or the student and you can do knowledge transfer is what I call it and learn from each other. So that's that. Thank you, Lydia. That was awesome. Uh, I put in the chat to see if there's any last minute questions, but I don't see any. So um, any last words? Uh, Lydia, you want to start it off? Yeah, I think another thing except that I want to um, just advise folks is that like I Zach mentioned earlier is that you do do a lot of imposter syndrome right when I first started this pivot I was like well am I good enough will I succeed in this job that I had right um and even when I was working and I was around senior level folks staff level folks folks for many years I still was insecure in my abilities and in my skills 
but I created a small notebook, a little list, and I wrote down different affirmations for myself that I would repeat out loud. I've also kept the uh, running document of accomplish accomplishments that I have made at my employer. And I would look back at it. I'd also keep a document of feedback, positive feedback, and also feedback that I work in terms of me working, being a better uh, engineer. And I kept that for myself. And whenever I had my moments of doubtness, wherever I doubted my abilities, my skills, I'd look back at this document and I'd get the validation that I needed because it literally was a document. And I'm like, I have done this before and I have done a lot and I have come thus far and I'm pretty sure I can do it. Um, so that's my last piece of advice. I love it. That's amazing. Um, for me, some of my last, uh, I guess, pieces of advice is really, you know, work on that branding. Don't be shy. There are people like me out there that want to help you kind of break out of that shell, make yourself feel comfortable. Uh, Cafe Cultura, we work on that um, because I know that a lot of tech people love to be behind the scenes and not in front of the scene. But sometimes building your brand is being that person. So just keep, you know, going through focusing on on networking, I think is really, really important. Um, and that's helped me a lot with the imposter syndrome as a founder. And it was hard for me to say, oh, I'm a founder in tech for a long time. <laughs> because, you know, I was still I felt like I didn't know enough that I wasn't good enough that I wasn't in the right space that, you know, I only knew this part. So I think that, you know, getting over the imposter syndrome and like you said, words of affirmation, things, writing those things down are super important. Um, and just, you know, keep building your brands. You never know who's looking. People, that's something I've learned along the way with networking and such. They look you up. They're looking at your pages. They're looking at what you got coming up next. And you never know when an opportunity can open. And thank you guys for Geeks Academy for having me. And Cafe Cultura now, Zachary, back to you. Yeah, I, I probably can't follow up either of those. So just feel free to contact us um, if you have any questions. Or personally, I think that uh, Krishana dropped in our, our LinkedIn's and we, we're also open to, to share our emails and anything like that. So um, feel free to, to have us as a resource. Um, we really do appreciate 4 Geeks Academy again for everything. Um, sorry you went over time, but we were really excited about this. So. Um, so yeah, here we are. And I guess I'll, I'll pass it back to Alyssa or anyone from 4 Geeks, uh, I suppose. Thank you guys. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it was really awesome to have you guys. Um, if you guys are here in South Florida, I know Cafe Cortura does events, so please follow them on LinkedIn um, and stay in the know about what's happening. Um, and 4 Geeks does have these events from time to time where we invite different organizations. So uh, those are always posted on 4geeks.com and on Slack. So please come to our other events and support. Um, yeah, I guess that's all. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. This event will be on our YouTube channel. So if you want to um, kind of revisit the questions and the answers, you can check it out again. Um, probably by tomorrow, it, sh it should be uploaded. Um, thank you again uh, very much for coming and to the students and staff for attending. We will see you guys very soon.